Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Alan Blake. Our webinar will start in a moment. We're just waiting for everyone to join the meeting. Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. We will start in just a moment. We're just allowing time for everyone to log into the meeting. Welcome everyone to the PAC webinar, the Holy Grail 2.0 Digital Watermarks Initiative. I'm delighted that you're able to join us today. My name is Alan Blake and I am the PAC Next US and Food Director. I hope that you continue to be safe and well. And again, I'm delighted you're able to be with us and to stay connected with us. And I know that we welcome participants from around the globe. So again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We have some upcoming events, and I'd like to talk about those. So we have a webinar on October the 30th. This is the packaging paradox during COVID. And we have two great speakers, Jean-Pierre Lacroix from SLD and Dr. Sylvain Charlebois from Dalhousie University. So look out for that. You can sign up with that on October the 30th. Now, as part of the webinar, we'd like you to participate with your questions. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and then questions will be answered following the presentations. So you can just hover over the, the box, you'll see the Q&A come up, type in your questions, and again, we'll, we'll deal with those at the end. So I'm now delighted to be able to introduce our two speakers today. We have Larry Logan, and Larry is the Chief Evangelist for the Digimark Corporation, and he enjoys more than 30 years success in marketing and creativity, repeatedly developing brands that become industry leaders. Again, he is the, currently the Chief Evangelist at the Digimark Corporation, the inventor of the imperceptible Digimark barcode identifier for all types of media. In that role, Mr. Logan is leading the company's efforts to create a new standard for the automatic identification of plastics through a form of technology described gen generically as digital watermarking. And you're gonna hear a lot more about this during the presentation. I'd also like to introduce Guyane de Belder. Guyane is technical director and packaging technologist at Procter & Gamble. In his 20 plus year career at P&G, Guyane has helped drive R&D into sustainable packaging across the company with experience in upstream technologies, sustainable resins and EU funding projects. Guyane has been involved in developing key partnerships across the value chain and managing open innovation through P&G's Connect and Develop program. And of course, most recently, Gian has been leading this three-year pioneering project, Holy Grail, on the standardization of markers, watermarks in packaging to increase efficiencies and high quality sorting and to strive for higher re recycling rates as part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's new plastics 
Economy Initiative. And again, you're going to hear lots more about this during the presentation. So with that said, I'd now like to invite our speakers to come in and share what's going to be a really exciting presentation for all. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, for the, for the introduction. So indeed, <clears throat> we're going to talk about uh, the Holy Grail 2.0 uh, initiative, uh, which is an initiative all around revolutionizing sorting and recycling uh, by means of intelligent packaging enabled by digital watermarks. So we're going to give this uh, presentation um, in three sections. I will take care of the first section, um, give you a little bit of history. Um, later on, we will move uh, to Larry, which will explain digital watermarks in much greater detail. And I will finish off with uh, the current and the future outlook on this, uh, on this project. Good, so let's move to the next slide, please. Um, the next slide is really all about where does it fit into a circular economy, right? So this is the, the famous five pillar slide, as I call it. Um, what needs to be true to make packaging work into a circular economy. So on the left-hand side, you see the first pillar, which is all about designing for recycling and circularity. That's really our job as brand owners and retailers to ensure that we are designing the packages such that they can enter back into, um, into the value chains, into, an, uh, in, into a circular economy. Second one is obviously then linked to access to collection. Um, again, in Europe, um, there are quite some different collection schemes in place. So there is a need for harmonization. I um, think in, in North America, obviously, um, there is a need also to have much more collection systems um, in place. And definitely in some parts of the world, there is nothing, right? So um, infrastructure is, is definitely one of the key pillars here as well. The third one is then all about educating the, the consumers. So motivating them to do the right thing at the end of the life of a package. And that's basically also where things like um, how to recycle labels can help consumers in making the right decisions. The fourth pillar is all about the innovation in separation technologies, and that's basically where Holy Grail all got started. And that's also something I will, uh, that we will address in more detail during this presentation. But if you have all of these four pillars in place, we really can talk about um, high quality and high quantities of recycled from, uh, materials for which we still need to find end markets. And a good end market is obviously to put it back into packaging, which is um, nicely fitting into PNG sustainability goals. Um, and that's really important, right? Because if there's no end market, then obviously um, you never will end up in, into uh, circular economies of, uh, of packaging. In a nutshell, um, the big bottlenecks, the two big bottlenecks today is really on the collection, um, linked to collection schemes and participation of, it, of uh, consumers, but also very importantly, also sorting, right? So if we can crack those two bottlenecks, then uh, we really can talk and increase uh, recycling rates in, um, in general. Moving to the next slide, and I'm not sure if the slides are still visible for people. At least they disappeared on my screen. Technical glitch, I'm sorry, I'm fixing that. No problem. Now. Sure, no problem. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay, so um, I was talking indeed about the sorting challenge. Um, and sorting also has been highlighted by many uh, stakeholders as, as being a key outage today. If you move to the next slide, you see it. Um, it, was, uh, it was a kind of a public poll during one of the Plastic Recyclers Europe events uh, where at the times when we still could travel. And the question asked to an audience of around 300 people was like, what impacts the recyclability of a package? And obviously, as you can see, sorting was highlighted as number one. Let me give you a, uh, some, some background on Project Holy Grail. If we move to the next slide, please. Um, Holy Grail uh, was established under the New Plastics Economy from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, about four years ago, I have been pitching the ID to start investigating intelligent packaging for better sorting. 
um, that ID moved into what they call a pioneering project, which is basically collaborative projects uh, with the partners you can see there on the bottom of the slide. And the key question um, we wanted to uh, address at that moment in time is like, should the industry um, looking into using more chemical tracers, which are typically for fluorescent items, you would add to a, to a package that gives you a uh, specific signal under light conditions, or should the industry look into digital watermarks? I can tell you back in 2015, nobody ever heard about digital watermarks, especially not people in the recycling industry. Um, so we have been working this one for three years within the new plastics economy. And one of the key conclusions coming out of there was really that there is much more value in digital watermarks than traces. And uh, a lot of the stakeholders in the project um, really wanted to focus uh, efforts really on digital watermarks and really how to bring it to life. So that was one of the reasons, and you will hear it later, that we will continue looking into digital watermarks with Project Holy Grail 2.0. And uh, we are uh, only focusing actually on digital watermarks uh, simply because it gives you much more value. Now I talked a little bit about, or I talked a lot about digital watermarks. What is it, what is it, right? So that's really the next slide in a nutshell because Larry will talk a little bit more in details. If we move to the next slide, please. Yep, so you can see it here. So Alan also was referring to imperceptible codes. Um, so this is one way to integrate digital watermarks by means of artwork. So what we are doing is basically a Photoshop manipulation of, uh, of artwork, in this case, the shrink sleeve where you basically would use uh, existing ink. So the white ink in the middle, for example, you're gonna use to make very small dots in the right hand corner in the blue area and vice versa. We would use the blue ink from the right hand corner and put small um, blue dots uh, in the middle, in the white area. By that way, we are actually creating imperceptible codes uh, which are hardly visible to the consumer. But if I would start scanning um, that package with an, uh, an um, easy, cheap cameras such as the one on my iPhone, it actually would be detected as a multitude of codes. So that's really, in essence, um, what it's all about. It's purely a, um, a modification, uh, Photoshop manipulation of your artwork. Um, we are using existing inks, we're using existing printing processes whatsoever. The picture here on the Lenar Beats is actually a commercial item um, as of last week. So we have been shipping this now into the German uh, market. Um, and we were um, very excited that uh, indeed uh, the first uh, bottles were hitting uh, the market uh, about, uh, about a week ago. So it's, it's relatively fresh from the press, let's call it like that. Now, integration into artwork is one way to do it. We also can um, implement it directly in molds. That's really the next slide if you want to click one further. Um, if we start uh, embossing molds, basically um, every time you produce an article, like in this case, again, the, um, the unstoppable bottle, um, the digital watermarks are there embedded um, into, the, uh, into the bottle structure itself. So, if we do it this way, then obviously it's a little bit more visible uh, towards the consumers because we always need to, to create a kind of, an, uh, of a contrast. Now, this is just one way. We have been piloting this one on PT bottles, as you can see here on HTP bottles, but also on trays. And that's basically, if you click further, uh, you will see that there has been quite some work happened in the space of trays. Um, with collaboration between uh, Digimark and Pack. Um, and they have been running a lot of trials on all kinds of trays. What you see here now is PT trays, but also they have been running it on, on polypropylene trays and other packaging items. But as you can see here, uh, you basically can start uh, programming more information, um, such as the, uh, if that package has been used for food content or CO2 equivalents or PCR contents whatsoever, right? So the technology is more than just, uh, than just uh, sorting or offering more than just sorting benefits. It also will come or can come with additional consumer benefits, right? Because my packaging article just became a kind of an internet of things and I can easily communicate with consumers um, 
for for quite a lot of things, to be honest, right? So ingredient transparency, but also packaging transparency, um, and even instructions um, in a digital way, like how to recycle this uh, this package. So moving on, um, I think my last slide is really um, another example of a development by Pacor. So here you see a polypropylene tub, and again, um, it was successfully implemented um, on these type of polypropylene uh, trays. So let's go a little bit further into the details. Um, now I'm just going to hand it over to Larry, uh, which is um, going to give you a little bit more information about signals and so forth. So Larry, up to you. Great, Ian. Thank you so much uh, for that overview. And what I'm going to discuss with you now and share with you is Digimark barcode. And we work in a field that's generically called digital watermarking, but Digimark barcode is the result of more than 25 years of R&D and success in terms of global deployments in a variety of different industries. <clears throat> in terms of what is a Digimark barcode, it consists of two key components. What you see on the left is a message signal, and this is structured data. It could be the product code, the SKU, internal tracking data, or other GS1 attributes. We combine that with a synchronization signal, and this lets us understand the relationship between the viewing device, the camera, the computer, and the object itself that carries the code. So we understand distance, skew, and rotation. We combine those together. Lindsay, if you'll advance, please. We combine those into what we refer to as a signal tile. And you see, it's pretty small here, really about the size of a postage stamp. And what we're going to do is take that signal tile and then replicate it throughout the media, whether that's in print or in the case of plastics uh, in three dimensions. Lindsay, next slide, please. So utilizing, uh, and go ahead, and I, I, I realize now we have these in sort of animations, but utilizing uh, common Adobe software tools, uh, Photoshop and Illustrator, that signal tile is gonna be replicated throughout the artwork. Now that's done by uh, slightly modulating the pixels that make up the design. Uh, that's it. And it utilizes contrast and color, but in a way that's low in terms of perceptibility by humans. In essence, it's designed to understand what are the weaknesses in the human visual system. Now it uses the existing pixels. There's no special inks and there's no special printing process. And a unique characteristic, which is especially important in terms of recycling, is that where you see the code blocks here, that it, uh, we don't even need a single tile in order to do a detection. So it's possible on the upper left hand, in the case of this Unstoppables bottle, that we can take a portion of the tile in the artwork, we can combine that with a portion of a tile in the lower right, and then in essence to be able to make a determination and a signal based upon that. And when you think about the compression, folding, uh, dirt, and all of those things that happen in recycling, it's this kind of robustness and error correction that we built into Digimark Barco. Lindsay? So as he had mentioned, we do the same thing in terms of applications in plastic. If you would, one more uh, click there, Lindsay. So we do this in a process that we refer to as micro topological variations. So we are creating <clears throat> this very slight change in the substrate itself. What you see on the right is really an earlier uh, version done by one of our licensees, uh, a bit more dramatic than what we currently do now, uh, but it creates in essence an embossing effect. And we're getting some excellent feedback from brands. One, the question, will I still be able to see the contents inside? And yes, consumers can still see the contents, but also it's a way that for, through a haptic means by touching the package, consumers might start to learn about the recyclability. So that's a good thing. And in addition to PACOR, we're working with other leading uh, mold and converting companies uh, in a wide variety of molds and molding processes. Next, please. So what this really means now in terms of recycling is that current methodology utilizes near infrared detection, which might be based on color or spectral analysis. It attempts to make a determination of the piece of plastic or the artwork that comes through based upon those characteristics. We invert that model where we put the intelligence into the package 
And then the package informs the system what it is. So it's far more precise, far more accurate. Really, it's an absolute identifier. And then in that way, because of all the robust information and attributes that are tied to the item, then the operator in the facility can sort based upon uh, what filter, what attributes they want to sort on. So it could be a positive sort, a negative sort, divide into different waste streams. That's all under the control of the operator. Uh, again, based upon the very rich attributes that are tied to this. And next, please, Lindsay. Yeah, that's just kind of a little animation there. So one of the things that we say, if we really take a step back though, what Digimark barcode is really part of a platform. And it's the idea that by creating intelligence, into these objects, that there's opportunities for value extraction throughout the entire package journey. In manufacturing, it might be parts matching. In distribution, it could be counterfeit deterrence, a gray market, a track and trace, a farm to home. In the case of uh, retail, uh, in aisle, retail operations and inventory, checkout, everything goes faster because uh, consumers and the cashier are not trying to twist the package, trying to find a a single visual symbology where we might have, let's say on a box of cereal, 300 replicated codes. At home, the consumer can point at the package and based on geolocation, get different information than was used in the store to make a buy determination. And then in recycling, and that's the new exciting area. So what we're really talking about here is the opportunity from birth to rebirth to extract value out of the package. Next slide, please. So Ian, is this one still mine? Back to yours? Yeah, you just can continue. No ah, yes, yeah. so uh, very much of the focus on Holy Grail and a lot of the attention and press has been on the sorting technology side. But as he had pointed out at the beginning, it's without driving collections, uh, industry sim will simply not be able to meet the regulations and the pledges in order to use, utilize more and more PCR content. So that same code now creates an opportunity for consumers to engage with the package and to be able to receive information about how to recycle. That can be also based on geolocation such that you and I might live on different sides of the street. We have different curbside waste providers, uh, but actually we get different instructions based upon the facility and the waste streams that they have. It's also an opportunity though for brands now to use the code for brand activation to engage with consumers. In the case on the right, uh, this was a package that's been used very widely for demonstrations where in essence through augmented reality, uh, the cow here <laughs> talk, talks to the uh, consumer and says, uh, make sure you recycle. Uh, and as you turn that package, then on the lower right, or you start to see the cucumbers, it actually goes to recipes and other information. On the lower left, Again, it's the way to point at the package and based upon the country or the municipality, there's instructions in terms of how to dispose of that package. The next, please. Don't forget, the in mole label cup is fully recyc mm, recyclable. So please recycle this pack. Be good for nature. See you soon. Terrific. So next slide, please. So this again, uh, a few slides from, uh, from PACOR, but uh, an interesting aspect here where the consumer, you see a consumer phone and you see this very rich information. An interesting aspect of the technology is that there's one code, but there can be a different response based upon the application and the device. So in this case, you see all the information that actually might be uh, very important to a recycler uh, in terms of the, the material and the content that can be avail available to consumers, but also depending upon the application, the device, by them pointing at the uh, tub in this particular case, it might have the augmented reality information that I showed you on the previous slide. Go ahead, Lindsay. Yeah, so he and back to you. Yes, thank you very much. All right, so indeed, um, we, uh, we also got some very nice uh, prime time on the BBC news. Um, I'm not gonna show the movie here, but it was really a good capture of what the technology is, is able to do. And if people do have an interest, um, 
you obviously find the uh, the link here uh, below below the slide. Now, <clears throat> during the project and as a kind of of the close out on the new Holy Grail 1.0 we have been organizing a couple of open houses at the um, Tomra machine vendor. Um, and I think in total around 200 people have been looking into that machine up and running. Uh, and we also actually prepared an, um, a quick movie to demonstrate it also in this, uh, in this audience. So let's have a look to that, uh, that movie um, so you can see uh, the machine up and running. So Lindsay, if you just can click one more. <laughs> Today I'm very excited to um, organize a second open house here at uh, Tomra headquarters in, um, in Germany. Uh, we actually had uh, 144 people subscribe for this uh, second open day where we um, have been explaining a little bit more about Holy Grail 2.0 which is our new uh, project solely focusing on the use of digital watermarks to make packaging more intelligent and use that intelligence across the full life cycle of a package. The event kicked off with presentations by Tom Eng, Senior Vice President and Head of Tomra Recycling, Nico van der Waal, Product and Circularity Economy Manager of Verstrada IML, and Larry Logan, Chief Evangelist of Digimark Corporation. There were 49 total products that were enhanced with Digimark barcode and delivered by brands for the demonstration, including a wide variety of formats for both print and plastics packaging, as you see in the left column. The photos show a representative sampling from this list, but not all of the packages are shown here. To detect the enhanced packages, a new configuration for detection was utilized using a newer version of Digimark software. The cameras capture frames of the packages, which go to Digimark detectors, to analyze both printed pieces and plastic substrates. Using a database of attributes about the package, the system determines which packages to positively or negatively sort and generate data and analytics. And here we see the combined components brought together into what initially will be a bolt-on module for existing sorting equipment installations. And now let's look at the setup for the demonstration itself. can choose to sort based on attributes. Here we only see coated plastic substrates separated out on the right. Products can be detected and sorted based on any attribute, such as food versus non-food usage, recyclable versus compostable, and detect black and opaque plastics. Here is what the camera sees at 10% of normal speed. Each small dot represents a Digimark detection point. And here is the conveyor running at 20% normal speed. Highly specular and crushed packages can still be detected, combining codes from different areas of the package. The participants were divided into two groups to allow easier access to view the various stages of the sortation process, and later adjourned for question and answer sessions. there is a future demand of the industry for instance to sub supply material uh, that's also possible to be implemented in food packaging. Uh, today's technology cannot solve this um, problem. So we believe that digital watermark can give the added value, the uh, additional information that will help us to also sort in the food and non-food um, quality in the future. 
As a worldwide leading supplier of sensor-based sorting equipment, we are excited to develop this new technology and to bring this to our clients and the industry. Perfect. Good. So let's move to the next. So um, I think so far you have seen indeed um, all the progress we have been uh, made under Holy Grail 1.0. Let's now um, have um, a quick look to what we are currently working in and what's really the future all about. So as I was mentioning, uh, we're going to uh, put this um, new initiative, uh, we'll, which will focus purely on, on digital watermarks now, under um, AIM, which is the European Brands Association. And the objective of this new initiative is really to prove the viability of digital watermark technologies for accurate sorting and the business case at a larger scale. Let's move on to the next slide, um, which is again, a very quick movie on the value of such sorting technologies um, for European targets, but I think you also can link it with any kind of US spec targets or whatsoever. So let's have a, a very quick look, on, uh, look at, uh, at this short movie. next one so i'm just going to go very fast on on, the, on, on these topics um, because obviously it's more related to to europe i think it's important for this audience to understand that in europe we indeed have a kind of a european green deal and one of the pillars is all about transitioning faster to a circular economy um, you see here a couple of, uh, of targets um, not easy to achieve um, and definitely there is a need to innovate um, in the space of both sorting and uh, and recycling and we believe that indeed Holy Grail um, can contribute um, to, these, uh, to these aspects. Moving on to the next one. Yep, I think you can do one further click. Um, there is indeed um, al already reference um, in some of the very important documents from the European Commission, ma mainly the essential requirements, but also the circular economy action plan is already referring to the value of digital watermarks. Uh, which we believe is a really good thing uh, because one day even we can make it part of the essential requirements which is basically mandatory requirements to put items um, onto the european market and i think it's that would be the greatest achievement we can we can imagine so that that all of the brand owners and retailers um, have to put these digital watermarks um, into their packages by law moving to the next one <clears throat> Again, I'm, um, I think we can skip this one. I've given you the, uh, the background, so let's, let's further click a little bit. I'm just going to try to skip a couple of items in the interest of, uh, of time. Yeah, click to the next one. And the next one, apologize for that one. Um, so currently, as you could see from, um, from, the slide, from the video, we currently have 90 plus members. Um, here are a couple of names. Not all of the 90 are in here. 
um, but the most up-to-date list also can be found back on the, on the website. Um, and in the last slide, I will make reference to that website. But you can see here clearly, it's a, a true representation of a full value chain, right? So we have, uh, we have a resin producer, we have converters, uh, we have machine builders, um, both Tomra and Palanque, globally the biggest ones active in this field are represented uh, in here. We have loads and loads of, uh, of brand owners. Uh, we have retailers uh, sitting here in, uh, in, in as well. And then obviously we have representatives also um, from, the waste, uh, from the waste industry. So I think by working uh, through all of these uh, partners, we hope that we can truly bring a difference and further um, develop the technology at an industrial scale. So let's have a look into the roadmap of what we actually want to do. It's the next slide. The first thing, so the, the uh, official launch date of Holy Grail 2.0 uh, was uh, September the 8th. Um, and pretty fast in the process, we got these uh, representation already from, uh, from 90 plus members, which was great. And the first thing we would like to do is to build um, a, a new um, prototype based on the latest specifications coming out of, of Digimark. So that's really foreseen to build that first unit uh, towards the beginning of 2021. Then we would like to ship that unit into what we call a semi-industrial testing, where we basically would like to investigate um, the impact of dirt, the impact of aging, the impact of crushing, basically uh, replicating a real industrial sorting plant um, in what we call the semi-industrial testing. So what it means is that all of the brand owners and the retailers that have uh, signed up for this project would uh, send some enhanced uh, packages um, into a semi-industrial environment uh, site, which already has been located. And we're gonna run all of those testing um, in that specific site on uh, real life um, equipment. Whenever that step, very important step is, is done, uh, we can then really start to think about scaling it up into national test market or national test markets. For the time being, we are assuming to run into three different test locations and by just easily moving um, the add-on module uh, from one location to another one, right? I think I've seen some questions also in the Q&A, uh, but how we want to implement is the fact that we really want to have add-on modules onto existing sorters, which obviously will uh, limit the capital investments. So we are just gonna bolt on uh, an add-on module made out of cameras, high-speed cameras and powerful LED lights and we're just gonna link it with existing near infrared uh, sorters. So that's really the, the plan. And then we easily can move that add-on module from one location to another. We do plan to, um, um, to test um, in, for example, uh, MRFs, uh, material recovery facilities, and or even at, at recyclers. Um, has not been decided yet, um, but both of these options uh, can be evaluated. Last or one of the next slides um, is talking more about the focus areas. So obviously we're going to focus a lot on intelligent sorting. Um, that was just the roadmap you have been uh, seeing in the previous slide, but also there will be a big focus on data mining, right? So we need to create a kind of a database um, that is then accessible to the waste manufacturers, um, both the MRFs and, and recyclers or whoever needs it. And um, they then basically have a much better tool to start sorting the waste in the fractions they want, right? So the idea here is it's going to be a cloud-based system, uh, potentially with, uh, with, with GS1, which also um, has uh, some, some good uh, track records on managing uh, standard barcodes. Um, and the idea would be that the waste in the industry can download the latest versions onto their machines and then can decide themselves um, how to sort the waste. So we are providing them with the tools and then obviously in their operation, they, for example, can decide to um, make um, food grade versus non-food uh, grade whatsoever. 
this is very important um, because it goes back to the first point on the, on the intelligent sorting, right? So on that one, you also can think about three key focus area, rejection of certain things, right? So things you don't want to have in your streams in the, in the sorting centers, think about compostables, think about uh, items like do it yourself, items with silicones. These things do not belong in a sorting center and maybe you want to negatively sort them out. So that's really the first part there on rejection. Another one would be to add more streams, right? So there's quite a lot of um, conversion um, from multi-layer uh, materials um, um, into mono materials. Um, the question is always like, um, how can I effectively sort it? Um, think about pouches. Uh, there's quite a lot of conversion into mono polyethylene, but a standard near infrared sorter won't, uh, cannot make a differentiation between a pouch, which is a laminate versus one which is typically uh, safe to be sent to a polyethylene stream. And then the last part there is uh, defining streams. Uh, we have been talking about food and non-food grades, but also think about opening it up to more streams than just food and non-food. Think about detergent grades, PCR, think about cosmetic grades, PCR, and so forth and so forth. And then the last focus area is definitely on the consumer um, engagement. Moving on, um, again, we have a full structure um, in place within, uh, within AIM. Uh, we have a charter. Everyone can have a look into, uh, onto, onto the website. The charter is, is there. There are technical working groups uh, established. Um, in fact, Larry just came out of uh, providing a training in, um, in uh, three master classes. Um, and we have also a full leadership team um, in place. Again, all of the information is on the site. So I'm just going to move on to the next slide, please. There is a um, secretariat for the, uh, the daily uh, support, but also very important, we have been hiring a technical project manager, uh, Anne Vossen, which has a lot of um, relevant um, industry experience in, uh, in waste and waste manufacturing. So she's acting now as a consultant to the group and she's doing a very good job. Last but not least, we also have legal counsel, which is very important in the, into these type of cross-value uh, chain collaborations, uh, because obviously there's quite a lot of um, competing companies trying to work together. To end, um, I just wanted to uh, provide you with a quote from uh, Michelle Gibbons, which is the DG for AIM. Um, I think the nice thing about digital watermarks is that you really are combining three key ingredients uh, innovation, sustainability, and digital. Um, and this is really uh, nicely linked towards the uh, European Green Deal. So I think with that, uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, this is the end of the presentation. I was referring indeed um, to the website where you can find much more information for those people uh, that want to read a little bit more about it. Um, but I suggest we open the floor for, uh, for questions. Thank you. Larry, Guillaume, thank you very much indeed. Let me just remind everyone to hover over the top or the bottom of your screen to find the Q&A and you can type your questions in there. And we have lots of questions. So we're going to do our utmost to answer them and we'll get going with, with these. So here you go, Larry, Guillaume, you ready yes. for this lot? And they're <laughs> yes. great oh, questions, yeah. great questions. Yeah. So here's, here's the first one. How can digital watermarks be incorporated into natural unprinted films? So they're thinking of cast films, blown films, extrusion coated films, and then what would be required to manage the Digimark during printing? Yeah, a couple of things there. If, it, if it's not printed at all, then there's nothing there to create contrast. Uh, is it possible then to emboss you know, a fine film uh, it's something that we're being asked about, uh, and there's there's some early exploration of that. But part of that really has to go to the structural strength of the film itself. And what I mean by that is if you think about compaction and crushing later, or how it's even handled, then there's there's the chance very much that just those impressions uh, might be in essence debossed, such that they no longer have any sort of physical structure that would be detected. So I think that's certainly gonna be a challenge in those films, but certainly there's some interest and in some explorations that, that will be going on. Yeah, maybe just to build on that one, right? So I think indeed we need to make a differentiation between cast and, and, and blown film. I think on, on cast film, 
you can think about embossing the uh, the calendaring rolls. Um, so that should be an, an option. For the blown film, indeed, uh, that's going to be somewhat more difficult. Um, now, what you typically could do is to um, to implement uh, small black dots into a film. And, and yes, that, that means printing it. Um, I'm aware of that one. Um, but I'm always amazed if I'm getting a, a business cards from, from, from Digimark, right? So they're white business cards um, with my consumer eye. I can't see a difference, but if I use my phone, I actually can scan it, right? And the way they do it is indeed they print small dots. I don't know the color, Larry, you need to help me, but it could be a small black dot. Um, and that gives you the code. So I think for blown film, if there is a need, um, that could be one of the uh, one of the options. Okay, guys, thank you. That was very detailed, and, and I'm sure we can have some follow up. Uh, we'll provide contact details for Larry and Gian. So if you want follow up, you can do that uh, after the webinar. This next question is around level of acceptance by consumer goods companies and incorporating Digimark into their packaging. So what do you think is needed before uh, recyclers will invest in sorting capability for Digimark? Ian, do you want to start? Yeah, so I think, I mean, let me first take the point from the acceptance from brand owners and, and retailers, and then Larry, you, you, can, you can continue maybe on the, on the investments and so forth, right? But I think from a branding point of view, obviously the fact that these codes are imperceptible uh, is a good thing. I think maybe up till five years ago, it was much more visible versus where we are standing today. And if you would be able to have a look into one of the um, the packaging items that uh, we as brand owners are now putting into the marketplace, I think it's hardly noticeable for, for consumers, right? I mean, the Lenore sleeved one has been going through a very thorough process with our uh, designers and marketeers, um, and it was accepted. Um, we also see other companies um, that are doing similar efforts, um, other brand owners in, in the group um, that also are launching as we speak. Um, so I think more and more there is some, uh, some general acceptance um, on the concept, simply also because the imperceptible codes have become more imperceptible. Yeah, I might point out on the on the recyclers, I think one of the great uh, values of the initiative is that it does include uh, Veolia and Suez and, and others, uh, you know, facility operators, plastics recyclers, Europe and others. So I think very much those business models uh, will be you know, uh, sort of resolved uh, over time as we do the testing. I think in addition though, cost would certainly uh, always be a, a key determinant, but there's also other, I'll, I'll refer to it as regulatory pressures. So there's a document right now in terms of the European Commission that uh, it's very much a, a focus on facility operators and their ability to create greater efficiency and to be able to report that efficiency. And digital watermarking is being seen as one way for them to be compliant. Uh, with those requirements in terms of greater measurement and greater sortation. It's indeed a good point. And I think, I mean, <clears throat> one of the items we didn't talk was the fact that um, the technology allows you to have much more data granularity, right? So that the EU commission is even looking into like, how can I define if a package is recyclable or not? Right? Today you can't, you, oh, you have a couple of guidelines, but you don't have actual percentage numbers. If you're now gonna start calculating those numbers um, according to new regulations at the end of a sorting center or at the beginning of a recycler, I mean, you, you pretty much can do it even on a product level, right? And that really gives quite a lot of, uh, of value. The other item next to uh, governments, uh, which all have very ambitious targets is obviously the value of EPR schemes, right? Um, and it's pretty good to have uh, extra uh, which is a kind of uh, European alliance of quite a lot of EPR schemes uh, sitting in this initiative and also sitting in the leadership team uh, because obviously they're also looking into innovation in, in, in the field uh, simply because they also need to, um, to meet the targets. Now, as I was saying in the beginning, um, the objective of Holy Grail 2.0 is also um, to prove 
technicalities of the project, um, of, of the technology, sorry, digital watermark technology, but really also the business case at, uh, at a larger scale. And that's also where quite a lot of the, the waste manufacturers, and Larry mentioned indeed too, as in the violas of this world, will take part in um, as well, right? So that's, I think, an, um, hopefully a not too detailed answer to the question. Uh, that's that's great. Very helpful. Here's here's another interesting one. Uh, what happens with a bottle that has a sleeve on it, and potentially you have two watermarks on that package? How would a sorter deal with that? Yeah. So uh, it's the same concept, whether it's in print or on the plastic bottle. However, the what we refer to as a grid structure in essence, how that code is communicated or structured is different in print versus in plastics. And we do that so that there's not confusion in other applications such as front of store checkout, where we don't want the plastic necessarily to overreading what's there in terms of uh, print and create any kind of conflict. So what happens is that the shrink film has its code, the underlying plastic has virtually the same code, but in a way that, that is read differently in a recycling facility or, or, for example, in front of store checkout. So the shrink sleeve says, what am I? What am I made of as a material? But also it can say, what am I wrapped around? What is the material that's underneath me? And so uh -huh. therefore, where shrink film today might mask the plastic where it can't be read by NIR, this is a way in terms of uh, sending it to the right waste stream based upon understanding what are both of the components in terms of the shrink sleeve and the plastic. So you've just defined smart packaging there, Larry, I think. Hopefully so. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Here's a great question. What's uh, required for a design firm to begin incorporating the digital watermarks into packaging design? Well, Alan, if I may, I, I think we skipped one, and I think it's an important one in terms of the cost to retrofit. I was going to catch MRL. that one later, Larry. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'll jump to technologies. Uh, if you're a design firm or a pre-media company, you already have the tools and you're using them every day. And that's Illustrator and Photoshop. We're also integrated into ESCO and other processes for uh, you know, trapping and quality control and things like that. A key thing though is uh, we provide the tools. I mean, we're technologists, but we don't get in the way. And what I mean by that is that a brand continues to use their existing pre-media suppliers or design firms. They don't have to come to Digimark per se. They do initially just to set up an account uh, to, in essence to get access to a barcode, but that, that account can be handed off to their uh, suppliers who actually can, can enhance packaging, utilize the Digimark barcode. So we never want to be a constraint or a bottleneck. Uh, we want uh, brands to continue with their current work workflow and their current operations as they do today. Great, fantastic. So uh, let's just touch on this. You talked about how you're looking to scale up here with the pilot, and then you're going to you're going to run real life trials with you know dirt, looking at time crushing contamination and all of this. And you're going to come out with a conclusion that this combination of high-speed cameras and LED lighting is going to work. How do you imagine you're going to scale this? And this just then obviously goes into the cost. You know, how would we imagine scaling this in North America and looking at the you know the hundreds thousands of MRFs that we have? What is the thinking behind how we will just manage what? clearly in terms of capital is going to be a significant uh, sum, but individually might be, you know, very doable. So what is your thinking around this scalability and cost? Well, I think there are two parts to it. And Hian can certainly address really under Holy Grail on the global scaling. But I do want to make a distinction here, uh, you know, based upon Chris's question. And that is that in order to lower the barrier for facility operators to get started is that the concept and what we've demonstrated today is what we're referring to as a bolt-on module. So this is a module that can sit in front of NIR but work in parallel with NIR. And it's a quicker, lower cost way for a facility operator to get started without having to pull out 
in essence, or retrofit uh, their complete existing systems. Now, over time, and we're working with Pelink and Tomra, there'll certainly be others, but over time, then the, it'll be more of a full integration of Digimart into their larger shipping units. Uh, but this is a way at a lower cost. What that cost is, we're still working with the equipment manufacturers to look at that cost uh, based upon scale and processing power. The great thing is that every year those costs keep lowering, uh, but at some point we'll have more guidance on that. And then Ian, in terms of, you know, over to you. No, well, I think, I mean, <clears throat> the idea really is to do the full upscaling process out of, of Europe. Um, we indeed mentioned uh, Pelang Tomra. I mean, they're both based in, in Europe, so it makes sense to do it here, um, but obviously also driven by the European Green Deal and all, all of the sensitivities. Uh, on plastic strategies, uh, which is pretty hot topic in, in Europe, right? So we first would do it here according the, the roadmap um, and that machine that we would like to test in the industrial um, facilities can be considered as the first commercial add-on uh, add unit. We indeed then would envision that the technology would travel to, uh, towards uh, other regions, including North America, Canada, um, and I think what we want to do is to, um, to find a very similar uh, setup as the one we are having here in, uh, within, within, within AIM and also then evaluate um, the value uh, for recyclers because at the end of the day, I mean, if, if, if you look into the world of recycling, there is mechanical recycling, there is dissolution recycling, there is chemical recycling, gasification, pyrolysis and, and, and many more things. But guess what? All of these different processes, um, they all do need to have very good feedstock, right? Through a, through a sourcing process to make them economically viable. Um, so we see a lot of value for any kind of recycling process, but really it's all about upgrading um, the PCR quality and hence a recycler um, and the respective waste manufacturer eventually can sell their PCR at the right market price, right? So today, if you if you look to film recycling, that typically ends up in, in, in a lower end application. Um, in the future, there will be PCR grades available for film, which then those recyclers can, uh, again, sell at a higher pricing, right? So it's it's all about economics and, and, and the calculations have to be made really on a local level and see where the recyclers and the waste industry in general um, can get the benefits uh, can get the benefits from. Thanks. So, gentlemen, I'm going to ask a favour. If if you are able to hang with us an extra five minutes, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. But let me just uh, talk to our partic participants at the moment. I understand that on the hour, many people go to their next meeting. So please, everyone is going to receive a recording of the webinar and you'll get the slides and the key takeaways. So please note that that will be sent to you and, and keep you know, following pack on you know, www.pac.ca for our upcoming webinars. But for those of you who would like to hang on for an extra five minutes, I'm gonna ask Larry and Gian to answer a few more of the questions that have come in. So is that okay with you, Larry and Gian, for an extra five minutes just to answer sure. some of the other, other questions? Of course, thank you. And to our participants, it's absolutely fine if, if you need to leave. As I said, you'll get a recording. But for those of you who can hang on, I'm going to ask some more of these questions. So here we go. Does the consumer engagement augmented reality experience require a native mobile app to be downloaded? Hopefully you understand what that's asking, yes. Larry or Gian. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. I mean, it, at this point, that app does require a Digimark software development kit to read that. And we've done, we're, we're in Walmart's app and, and other apps. Uh, and the uh, process to do that only takes a matter, a matter of hours and a little bit of quality control, but it, it's very straightforward. It doesn't impede what the current design is of that app. It simply integrates into it. A great example uh, last year was Walmart and their Christmas catalog uh, where consumers could point to uh, images and then had that pulled up into to an ordering form. Certainly uh, we will work uh, to hopefully be integrated to be native to both uh, iOS and Android. Uh, there's a great deal of industry support behind that. 
But of course, those are business decisions by those uh, you know, respective companies. Uh, but we certainly appreciate uh, the value and the ease that that'll provide to consumers. Also in the case of recycling, it's very likely that much of those experience would be done from their, uh, let's say country or their curbside provider. So in the case of CTO in France, uh, might well have an app, Clarabelle in, in Belgium, the various green dots, where it's really much more tailored uh, to provide uh, you know, other information, other value in terms of their account, other instructions, other guidance. Uh, and it's very simple for us to get integrated into any of those. Okay, thank you. So as a kind of an extension of this, this question is, can you combine an EAM barcode and a QR and augmented reality in only one Digimark code? Uh, yes and no. So part of the question goes to what is the length of the data that it would, that it would hold? And we very purposefully, and this goes back 25 years ago and has been proven over and over again in terms of our global deployments, the most efficient way to do this in a way that does the least amount of disruption to the artwork or the video or the audio is to utilize a very smaller, uh, small code that points to the cloud where there's virtually unlimited data. And the beauty of that is that that data can always be updated. So currently a QR code would point, let's say, to a specific URL that's hardwired. But if that changes, then you sort of have to keep jumping to different URLs. Our particular case, it always points to what is the most current and common uh, information. However, another interesting aspect is that we can serve functionally the same thing as a QR code, UPC, EAN, data matrix code in this way. And that goes back to, I probably mentioned earlier that based upon the context and the device, that there's a different response. So let's say the code is one, two, three. To a front of store checkout, one, two, three might be $4. One, two, three to a consumer with a smartphone takes them to a totally different uh, brand experience. Two inspection systems, one, two, three says that's the wrong label that's coming together on that shampoo bottle, that particular case. So actually it's a far more by using that platform approach, it actually gives you the flexibility in essence to accomplish in one code, what all these separate codes do now, which simply, you know, take up packaging, uh, real estate, uh, you know, and removing opportunities for, for marketing to make use of that space. Thank you, Larry. Here's one related to compostable and non-compostable packaging. So could Digimart be used to reduce contamination caused by non-compostable packaging at organics processing facilities? Because this is often a a common issue that you can't tell the difference between compostable and non-compostable, mm -hmm. and therefore you get contamination challenges. Correct, and I think indeed, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, we see a lot of um, items that are labeled as being industrially compostable or home compost or whatever it is, but eventually uh, never will make it into a uh, composting site, right? Um, if we're going to label these packaging items um, to the target uh, stream, being at a compost site, industrial composting site, or um, recycling site, uh, it's indeed uh, true that we, at the start of, of or at the entry of your um, compost site, you can basically kick out all of the items that um, should not belong into your streams, right? So. I think I mentioned the um, the uh, the opposite um, in a sorting site. You can kick out all of your compostable items and send them for industrial composting. But obviously, yes, also vice versa. In your industrial composting site, you also can kick out the standard plastics, which never will will uh, will make it into composting. So the answer is yes. If you're going to use negative sorting. Okay. There's been several questions around tracking and tracing and being able to track and trace a package and whether it has recycled content and confirm that it's actually been recycled. Is that a reality with the attributes in the package and reading of it that we could confirm that we've tracked it, traced it, and it's been recycled? Uh, the front end part would be 
Yes, by putting a code there and by the manufacturer ascribing certain attributes, then those attributes are available, uh, you know, again, for different processes and machines and computing, et cetera, as, as it goes through that package journey. As it goes through the uh, sorting process and through the other end of the facility, that code's going to be lost. So uh, it just sort of shows in essence, as robust it is, it will be, once it's broken down to flakes, uh, it, will be, it will be lost. Now, what some brands are doing uh, already is that uh, part of the, in, the, in their mold uh, or in the attributes they're ascribing, they are saying, what is the PCR content that right. is already in that particular package? So that's one way that they're communicating it there. And I, I'll always defer to Hian as the expert on, <laughs> no, and on I think all we, things packaging. Yeah, thanks, Larry. So I think we need to make a differentiation on the question uh, if you want to track PCR or if you want to track recyclability, right? As Larry was, was indeed mentioning, once um, the package went through a kind of a grinding operation at the recycler, the code is, is gone, which indeed is a very good thing because we are not risking of cross-contamination later on. So in terms of determining the recyclability, effective percentage rates, yes, it can be done simply by just counting the amount of products uh, one MRF would, uh, uh, would convert in, in a month or whatever the number is gonna be, right? Um, so that can be done. Um, in terms of uh, tracking PCR, that's more difficult. And I'm also not sure if that's gonna be required. I mean, there's quite a lot of efforts going on with the APR, but also with Plastic Recyclers Europe in terms of chain of custody. Um, right. So I'm, I'm actually not convinced um, you really need to put something in the, in the resin really to, to have a good uh, track and trace system. So a chain of custody uh, would be probably the way out as well. Thank you. All right. I think we ought to wrap up here and ask the two of you gentlemen, if you'd like to leave some final thoughts and comments with the audience. So let's go to you first, Larry, for final thoughts and messages you'd like to give to the attendees. Well, Alan, thank you again uh, and to your members for the opportunity to, to join you today. And hopefully this, this presentation has been informative uh, and the activity that's going on in the US, in, in Europe, I'm sorry. But actually what we are also looking forward to is you know, how do we really get going uh, over here in North America? And one of the things that we'll be looking forward to is the support and sponsorships, you know, of organizations such as yours and, and APR, you know, facilities. And so we're really kind of looking at uh, some of what we've done uh, in Europe, but looking for those opportunities here uh, in the U.S. So we welcome that kind of support. You know, please reach out. Uh, you can reach me at Digimark uh, Corporation. I'm sure Lindsay will provide the, the email later. Uh, but and again, thank you again for the opportunity to join you today. Thank you so much, Larry. Gian? Yeah, I think I only can can echo that one, right? I mean, yes, uh, quite some active work going on in, in Europe. Um, I think it's really the time to look into how can we bring it to North America and under which kind of, of structure, right? Um, I think we can learn a lot from from what we have been doing with, uh, with AIM. Um, there's obviously um, an, a kind of an uh, equivalent uh, association in, in the US. And it's really then all about bringing the full value chain uh, together, um, including uh, certain associations, uh, such as indeed uh, PAC, but also APR and, and some others, um, recruiting members, um, and then indeed um, implementing it, right? So I think, again, I wanted to thank also uh, you, Alan and, and Lindsay and the rest of the PAC team to give us the time to, um, to explain uh, Holy Grail. And I hope uh, with this, uh, people understand the value. Um, and I think I want to rephrase once more uh, the fact that it gives you value across the full life cycle of a package. It's more than just sorting, right? Because that's, uh, that's, that's, that's something we, we are hearing. Indeed, it all started with sorting. But if you really look to the value of a watermark uh, is the fact that you create value across the full life cycle of a pack. And, and I think with that, um, I would like to, uh, to finish the talk. Fantastic. Larry, Gian, what, just a great presentation. I'd like to thank all of our participants for hanging in there. Again, we will provide a recording with the slides and key takeaways. And there were several questions that we were not able to answer. 
I will forward them to Guyana and Larry and, and we'll hopefully share that as part of the, the key takeaways. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay well, and look out for the next PAC webinar. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.